Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Kelly McSweeney, Contributing Editor at CNEN Media, and I'll be moderating today's event. This webinar is titled, Recent Advances of High-Throughput Experimentation in Medicinal Chemistry, and is sponsored by Wuxi AppTech. CNEN works with sponsors to identify topics that are of interest and value to CNEN's audience, and consistent with CNEN's mission to provide news and analysis of the chemistry enterprise in a timely, accurate, and balanced fashion. During the webinar, you can adjust the size of the slides on your screen by grabbing the lower right corner with your mouse. If you need technical assistance, please look at the help widget at the top right corner of the screen, or type your query into the Q&A box. If you are disconnected during the webcast, please log in again according to the instructions you received earlier. You're encouraged to contribute to the success of this webinar by asking questions at any time during the presentation through the Q&A box on your screen. The questions will be answered at the end of the presentation, and as your moderator, I will pose as many as time permits. Please note that CNEN does not endorse any company, products, or services that may be mentioned in the webinars, and that each webinar will be archived at CNEN online after the live webcast. The presentation today is being sponsored by Wuxi AppTech. As a global company with operations across North America, Europe, and Asia, Wuxi AppTech provides a broad portfolio of R&D and manufacturing services that enable the global pharmaceutical and life sciences industry to advance discoveries and deliver groundbreaking treatments to patients. Through its unique business models, Wuxi AppTech's integrated end-to-end -end services include chemistry drug CRDMO, biology discovery, preclinical testing and clinical research services, and advanced therapies CTDMO, helping customers improve the productivity of advancing healthcare products through cost-effective and efficient solutions. During the presentation, we will hear from Dr. Tao Gua, Dr. Tua Zheng, and Dr. Suja Liu. Dr. Tao Gua is Senior Vice President, Head of RCS, BD, and IPM at Wuxi AppTech. He holds a PhD in Organic Chemistry from Columbia University. Dr. Gua has over 20 years experience in drug discovery, is the recipient of over 40 U.S. patents, and the inventor of one FDA-approved drug. He was formerly the Director of Chemistry at Pharmacopeia and Senior Research Scientist at Ariad Pharmaceuticals. Dr. Tua Jiang received his PhD from Stockholm University in 2014. He then went on to do a postdoc at ETH Zurich and worked for a few years on a startup project. He joined Wuxi AppTech in 2022 and is now working on coupling flow chemistry into daily laboratory workflows to support various research projects. Dr. Suja Liu received her PhD from Nanyang Technological University in 2014 and joined Wuxi AppTech in the same year. Since 2017, she has been in charge of the High Throughput Experimentation Platform, which has performed 100,000 reactions so far and provides great support to a variety of research projects. I will now hand it over to today's presenters. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. This is Tao Guo. I'm a senior VP and head of RCSBD and IPM. Wuxi AppTech is a global open platform company with operations across Asia, Europe, and North America. Using our unique CRDMO and the CTDMO business models, we provide integrated end-to-end -end services and solutions to farmer and biotech customers around the world to advance discoveries and deliver groundbreaking treatments to patients. We continuously add and expand our capability platforms to best serve our customers. In today's webinar, my colleagues, Dr. Si Jia Liu, and Dr. Tuo Jiang will introduce to you our high throughput experimentation and the flow chemistry platforms. 
Dr. Liu and Dr. Jiang are experts in their fields, and they will share the details of these new platforms. Now, let's welcome Dr. Si Jia Liu and Dr. Tuo Jiang. Hello, everyone. I'm Si Jia from Wuxi Aptech HTE platform. Today, me and my colleague, Dr. Jiang, are very honored to share the recent advances in HTE and flow chemistry at Wuxi Aptech. Our sharing today includes two parts. I will introduce the first part, which is about the recent advances of HTE technology. And my colleague, Dr. Jiang, will introduce the second part of flow chemistry after me. I would like to go through these topics. Firstly, briefly introduce HTE technique. Then we'll focus on a few cases that exemplify the power of HTE in resolving chemical issues. In the end, I would like to conclude with a short introduction of Wuxi Aptech HTE capability. High throughput experimentation, short for HTE, is a technique that allows the execution of large numbers of experiments in parallel. This technique oranges in the field of biology in the 1950s and is now routinely executed in 96, 384, 1536, 3456 well played. The first the chemical HTE screening was reported by Merck's lab in 2004. It's used for an isometric hydrogenation screening. This is the picture of the parallel reaction block that was engineered for asymmetric hydrogenation. And this is the very early pioneer efforts that HTE technique resolving a chemical issue. And after that, people started to widely introduce HTE to resolve challenging catalysis problems. This slide shows the evolution of HTE techniques in pharmaceutical synthesis, starting with the successful case of isometric hydrogenation by Mox group, then in 2007 to 2008, palladium and copper catalyzed cross-coupling started to utilize HTE technique, especially after backward group developed pre-catalyst, which is air stable, no need to do pre-mixing of palladium salts and ligands, the development of pre-catalyst further promoted a broader and a convenient use of HTE technique in palladium catalysis. Up to now, the pre-catalysts are still widely used in the daily HTE screenings. Subsequent efforts was expanded to chiral phase transfer catalysis in 2010 and to photocatalysis in 2011. In 2015, the boundary of the chemistry screening was pushed to 1536 well plate. In 2018, the HTE technique was revolutionized to next generation and enabled big data informatics. In very recently, the high T analyzer was used in HTE data analysis, and that will assist HTE to explore chemical dark space. After establishing the HD lab and capability in Merck's process chemistry team in 2002, the process skill up of theta glyphidine utilized HTE technique to optimize conditions. Dozens of condition parameters were screened, and the reaction was then successfully run in hundreds of kilogram scale, just less than six months after its discovery and the further successfully over 20 metric tons was made in total by 2007. HTE technique demonstrate its impact on drug manufacture for the first time. This process development won the Presidential Green Chemistry Challenge Award in 2006. Even until now, this asymmetric hydrogenation remains a challenging chemistry, and this process development remains an extraordinary milestone. HTE is now used in many companies or academic institutions. The feature of this technique is to use less precious reactive material to rapidly screen multi-condition parameters and to yield as much data or reaction information as possible. Which reaction do the medicinal chemists use the most? An investigation shows that the transition metal catalysis is among top five 
back the N aeration, N alkylation, and CC bond formations. Palladium catalyzed CN bond formation are usually challenging, and more than 50% failure rate was always seen. So HTE technique is still necessary to resolve the challenging chemistry issue of these most visited reactions. Next, I would like to go through some cases that can explain the power of HTE in resolving chemistry issues. This is a case study of a challenging CN bond formation reaction. I real air that can be very difficult in backward heartway coupling due to the air that I9 will inhibit the reaction by binding to palladium-2 intermediate. The active palladium-2 species will be off cycle after binding to air that I9. So using toluene in the reaction optimization is a solution that will decrease the solubility of air that I9. After screening different palladium catalyst followed by copper catalyst bases in toluene, one optimized condition gave the product mass at the major peak in the reaction else mass profile. The cycle time of the screening was less than 24 hours, and that saved the project scientists labor or time efforts on reaction optimization. HTE has also been widely used in the optimization of scale-up reaction. This is an intramolecular high correction. The major side product was the D-benzyl and D-bromo compounds. After looking into different catalysts, then screening extensive solvents or palladium loadings, the best combination of condition was optimized. The byproduct was decreased to less than 1% and the condition was further successfully applied in five, five kilograms scale up. HTE technique utilizing 3H4 well plates can also be applied in resolving chemistry issues, but the utilization is still very rare. This is a substrate scope exploration case conducted in 3H4 well plate. It's an amidation reaction all the reagents were prepared in stock solution by a rational design of the reaction, and the dosing machine finished the experiment setting up within 30 minutes. LCMS running was done within 48 hours, and the data analysis by Warsading software was done within 10 minutes. HDE technique can not only be used in traditional metal catalysis, but also applied in modern photocatalysis, and more and more scientists will use photoredox methods in the raw design for the CC or C heteroisom bond formations. We built up our photoredox HTE capability in 2016, and these are the representative photocatalysts, ligands, photoreactors, and wire holders for condition screenings. Next, I would like to introduce the use of HTE to solve chemical issues in photoredox chemistry. This is a condition screening case for challenging decarboxylative coupling, since there is no heteroatom adjacent to the alpha carbon of carboxylic acid. In order to make this challenging reaction work, it usually will need extensive screenings to find a best condition combination. They do other two representative case design for decarboxylative coupling in our lab. The 24 well reaction design is to screen three most efficient ligands, two photocatalysts with a few bases. And in 96 well format, more extensive of ligands to nickel and more bases will be investigated. For this reaction, we use the 96 well condition format. And fortunately, one optimized condition gave more than 80% else mass yield of the reaction. The extensive screening also indicated that different ligands to nickel is very crucial in the reaction outcome. The conditions optimized by HTE technique has good reproducibility in falling scale ups. In this cross electrophile coupling, after investigating the conditions in a 24 well format, 
a further batch scale up was also conducted using LED strips. 40 gram of the reaction was scaled with more than 50% isolated yield. This slide shows other popular photoredox reaction types that always need HTE optimizations in our platform, like decarboxylated coupling, cross-electrical coupling, molander salt coupling, CH activations, deoxygenative coupling, and the CN bond formations. For all these reactions, we have sophisticated condition templates designed with experience, and that will increase the success rate of these reactions and reduce the cycle time of the project. In the last part, I would like to conclude with a short introduction of Wuxi Aptic HTE capability. Thanks to the initial pioneering work in the HTE field, in 2014, Wuxi Aptic built the HTE lab of metal catalysis. And in 2016, we built the HDE capability of photocatalysis. These are a few pictures of our lab. This is the glow box, and all the reagents or catalysts were purchased from overseas vendors. There's also a microwave reactor for high throughput reaction, shakers, centrifuge, and mass instrument dedicated for 96 well plate. While conducting the high throughput reaction, so we have different well plates, filtration instrument, and the 96 well plate for LCMS analysis or reaction mixtures, storage, or the necessary lab wells. The reaction types in our HC platform, including transition metal catalysis, non transition metal catalyst reactions, and the photocatalysis. Like the reaction types that medicinal chemists use most in the survey I mentioned earlier. There's in total more than 40 reaction types. And for each of the reaction type, we have a case design with its current conditions. The diversity and the number of the reaction type or case design keep growing and updated. In the condition case design for these reaction types, we have an inventory of more than 100 catalysts including backward type precatalyst from generation one to generation six, mono or bidentate phosphine supporting ligands, copper catalyst and its supporting ligands, photocatalyst, catalyst for olefin metathesis, and the nickel catalyst. In recent years, significant advances in HDE automation and analytical technology have enabled HTE workflows to become even more efficient. This slide shows the automation in our lab. Utilizing robotic instrument to pre-fill catalyst into well plate, that will save labor efforts to dispense catalyst. We also use can be coated catalyst in the reaction dosing by calibrated scoops, which can also save efforts and can be used as an alternative automated technology in the reaction setting up. From the establishment of the first HTE lab in Wuxi Aptec in 2014, the reaction number increased every year. 460 reactions in the first year to 12,000 reactions in 2023. The orange bar is the number of photoredox condition optimizations since we built the photoredox capability in 2016, the reaction number increased from 1,000 to 17,000 reactions in 2023. The proportions of the photoredox reaction also reached to 58%. This modern chemistry tool has shown great impact on the project progress and the increasing interest in the road design. In total, we have finished more than 80,000 reactions and more than 1.8 million of conditions have been investigated with average 60% success rate. By success rate, that is the successful reactions after condition screening from the field reactions that already tried in the project team. We build multiple HTE groups 
and established more than one HT labs at each Wuxi Aptech site campus. These HTE labs were located in close proximity to the project centers, and that will create the chance for the HTE teams to have close collaborative relationships with the project centers. Our HTE teams have been trained with numerous directions and acquired rich experience, so the smart test design for the conditions have been play an important role in reducing project timeline or increasing success rate. That is all I would like to share today about the HDE technology, and I will be very happy here to invite our colleague, Dr. Jiang, to share their knowledge and experience of flow chemistry. Welcome, Dr. Jiang. Okay, uh, thanks Suja for the nice introduction of the HTE part. And uh, now it's my turn to give you some uh, introduction of our recent advances of flow chemistry in the early phase at the uh, Wuxi Aptech. So uh, what is flow chemistry? So by definition, flow chemistry involves reactions in the continuously flowing system instead of in a batch. Uh, here I put a general scheme to tell you the like a general picture of how it goes. So we take the simply one of the simplest scenario having two reagents going in and uh, one out thing. So you have reagent A and B, uh, two feeds get fed by two pumps, go to a mixer, then it goes to the reactor part. And the reactor part can be heated, cooled, irradiated, or by some other means, then you get the product out. Uh, one of the biggest difference in flow chemistry is you have the possibility you use a blood pressure regulator, uh, then you can heat up the reaction system to twice or twice of the boiling point of the system. By this means, you can push the reaction really to some extreme. That is something you can barely do in a batch or the max you can do in a very small seal flask, but never on the big scale. So generally, there are four choice of reactors, as you can see here. So the first one is the chip reactor, mainly going to the microfluidic system. And one of the good example is the Corning G1 type with the heart-shaped uh, tubing system and the, with a perfect mixing uh, efficiency. But for practical purpose usage, we would like to use the tube, the tubular or the coil reactor, which are made mainly from a PFA or from FEP, that's mainly for photochemistry, and also main, can be from a metal like uh, stainless steel, uh, Hasselhoff for corrosive uh, mixtures, and also copper in some cases. The third one is the packed back reactor, that's mainly for heterogeneous catalysis, like hydrogenation, as everyone can imagine. And also in the past uh, decade or so, it getting more popular in the field of uh, bio-related transformations using immobilized enzymes. That fits to the global trend of making chemistry or biology or everything much greener for the future. And the last one is the CSTR, which is continuous stir tank reactors. Uh, depends on who you ask. Some people don't really think it's a really flow system, but overall it can be a good solution when you have a solid containing slurries. So now we also did a little bit uh, detailed analysis of the pro and cons of flow chemistry before we actually do something. So it's quite clear or generally recognized the biggest advantage of flow chemistry is its highly efficient mass and heat transfer benefit from the increased surface to volume ratios. And because of that, the users can have more accurate control of the reaction conditions. And also comparably, the flow reactor, the reactor volume is much smaller compared to the one in batch so naturally secure a much better safety. And the other indispensable beauty is in flow, it's possible to have some access to some inaccessible conditions in batch. I will have uh, some examples coming up later. Of course, nothing is perfect. Uh, when we go to the microtubing system, the risk of falling and clogging is always an issue. It comes in generally two parts. It can be the initial solubility issue, but what is actually worse is some precipitation occurs during the process. That's why before we actually do something, we need to do careful analysis as well. And the other one, which actually limits or overall limits the adoption in the synthetic chemistry lab is 
when we start doing flow chemistry, we need to invest into the whole piece instruments, or we go to the, the self-assemble ones, like some pumps, tubing, connector, regulators. The cost can become an issue. And the other one is actually lack of uh, hands-on experience because there are some nice research groups in the uh, academic institutes. They have like serious research into flow chemistry, but overall the lack of the people with hands-on experience limits the general adoption of flow chemistry into the synthetic labs. And why do we want to put flow chemistry into the early phase? So. That's we did a little comparison of the the batch and the flow chemistry. So in batch chemistry, there are many reactions that are difficult to perform. It can be like related to EH regulations against hazardous reagents because we are a company. Uh, safety is always the top one issue for us. So we need to make sure things are being done in a good way and done in a safe way. And also some of the reactions by itself are just difficult to perform. Yeah. And the other kind of the limitation in batch is like everyone knows about that. It's the scale up effect is more severe. That leads to poor selectivity, lower yield, and a decrease in the overall efficiency. So we would like to make the best out of the advantages of flow chemistry, as I mentioned in the previous slide, as the new enabling technology to improve the safety and also to help expand the chemical space. And of course, we can help it to scale to secure the scalability and the quality, like namely the yield outcome and everything. And overall, we need to make sure the process is more reliable and the success rate are greatly improved. So about our current capability and capacity, we built internally flow chemistry as a new technology platform. So at this moment, we have 120 chemists and engineers supporting both FT and the FIFO service projects. And uh, they are located at all five chemistry sites in Shanghai, Tianjin, Wuhan, Chengdu, and Nantong. And uh, we started in late 2022, and uh, by the end of 2024 Q1, we finished more than 30,000 reactions, uh, ranging from gram, uh, milligram to kilogram scale, but mainly from gram to kilo, because flow chemistry generally shines better when scaling up. So there's a list on the right side. So I will not read through the names because I will have a case studies coming up later. But one thing more to share with everyone is uh, we are trying to, or we are still trying to convert more chemical reactions from batch into flow because we would like to have like a general feeling or to touch the border or the boundary of flow chemistry to understand what it can actually do. So some case studies here, as you can see, the first one is about flow chemistry. And flow chemistry due to the beer lumber law, the light penetration in batch is actually quite weak. That limits its uh, scale, scaling up uh, thing. So more or less flow chemistry is like a born to flow uh, chemistry. So here I have four examples here. So the first one is for this uh, benzylic bromination. We can do in the photochemical way. We can do like a really good throughput with 1.1 kilo in 90 minutes. And uh, when also coupled to some more modern photochemical transformation. Here we can do the cross electrophile, the, the deep bromonative uh, sp2, sp3 cross coupling uh, under photo conditions in flow. There is no problem. Here is another one using the active ester. You generate a radical, then you do the Minsky reaction. We can also do quite well. And here we can all use the amino acid to do the decarboxylated for cross coupling to make the CC bond here. And about the hydrogenation part, so internally we have a 63 supported catalyst. We have like a specialized a dedicated team uh, doing this job. And these 63 supported catalysts covering these six transition metals. And uh, they have different catalyst loading, different solid support. And also our uh, hydrogenation team, they have the knowledge and hands-on experience of do uh, reactivity tuning because many of the times the reactivity is just too high. So we can do some uh, doping to lower the reactivity. And also recently we started doing some uh, bimetallic uh, solid support catalyst to expand the scope and the capability. And some examples I can give you here is this one for the nitro reduction into the amine in the presence of aerial halide. We saw various amounts of uh, dehalogenation 
uh, side products. But with our internally supported Cobol catalyst, we can do this reaction quite well with no dehalogenation side product. And also everything was made in-house. So it's more uh, cost efficient. So we save roughly 80% of the overall cost. And also for the catalyst quality is more reliable and also one thing to mention, we also supply these 63 catalysts to our Wuxi STA team because for their uh, like relatively small scale uh, manufacturing, then they can use our in-house catalyst to avoid the deviation of the commercial catalyst quality. Yeah. Uh, the other one is about this uh, reduction, uh, double debenzylation and a partial reduction of this ring. We can do quite well with our in-house supported the palladium catalyst. And here's another example, we can do selective uh, reduction of this uh, bicyclic system. And the last one is we can do reductive amination using hydrogen inflow. And this slide is about some reactive intermediates re relating to methylation reactions, like mainly related to organolysium reaction. And the, the first example we have is uh, we can do deprotonation here, then react with a CO2 gas in situ, then after acidification, you get the uh, carboxylic acid out. And you can do this in batch at deep cryo temperature, minus 78, but you still have like low yield. But doing this in flow, we don't need that low temperature. We can do pretty well at minus 20 degrees with a decent throughput. And by doing that, like with much higher temperature, it becomes more energy efficient and also more time and cost efficient. And another example, we can do turbuli with a transform transfer with a pumping system is much safer. We can do like a kilo in two hours, no problem. The bottom two reactions actually points to the direction like in flow, we have access to some inaccessible conditions in batch. So the this example is in batch, we had only 10% yield because we saw uh, side reactions coming from the lithium migration. Namely, you have the bromo lithium exchange, then the lithium intermediate was not stable. It will migrate along the ring, and we even saw accumulation over the methyl group. Then we do in flow. In this case, we turbuli at the cryo temperature. Now we have like less than one second. Then we feed the electrophile in directly. In this case, it's an uh, aldehyde. Then another by 1.4 seconds then we get the secondary alcohol product out. And by doing this, we have 81% yield and we can do 200 grams in one hour. And this case is actually even worse. So you need to change the bully into an hex bully and also change the solvent from THF to CPME because this lithium, lithium intermediate is even worse. It will readily decompose. Then again, cryo temperature one second, we have put the electrophile in, another five seconds and we get the secondary alcohol out. So this is also reported in the literature and uh, because this is only possible in batch, then people put a name on it called the flash chemistry. Uh, this slide is about some reactive intermediates related to diosotization reaction. So here is the example of Sandemeyer reaction converting the amino acid in uh, amine group into the iodide then we can do quite well. And also we have other examples converting into the bromide and chloride. And here we have the amino group converting to the hydroxy group, into the azide, into the sulfonyl chloride. Due to the space limitation, I can tell you a little bit more. We also have examples converting amino group into the nitrile, CN, and also into the boronate. And also in some cases, we can also do converting the amino group into H more or less like a deletion of the amino group. And some hydride reduction. So we can do, because the hydride reduction generally uh, are very exothermic and you have a gas release. So we do this quite well with uh, condition control. We can do our age, good scale, boring. We can manage to lower the equivalent from 10 to three. Here is another a modified version of double H called LDBBA. We can do selective reduction of the ester into the aldehyde in flow. And the last one is worth like mentioning. So this is a paper reported in 2022 in the Journal of Organic Chemistry reported a reduction of the nitro group into the amino group without touching the aerial iodide. So this is a really good reaction. 
But the thing is, the reactivity was very high. So in small scale, like sub uh, 100 milligram scale, the reaction finished in one to two minutes. So after pouring the tetrahydroxy diboron, the reaction is more or less done. Then high reactivity comes at a price, just like the safety can be a problem. So when we try to do bigger scale, so the addition of the tetrahydroxy diboron was fast, then the exotherm of the reaction will almost force the reaction to the reflux uh, temperature of the DMF. Now you can imagine this can be a good, good example to put into the flow. So in this case, we transform perfectly. So 96%, 100 uh, degrees in 90 minutes, we cool the T shape or the two feeds when they meet, we cool down to 15 degrees. And at the kilogram uh, uh, preparation, we also need to cool it down to like minus 10 or even minus 20 in some cases because the heat generated per unit time is way bigger. So this is also a good transfer uh, transfer of the newly reported nice examples from batch into flow. And some uh, high temperature reactions. So this mainly talks about the batch inaccessible conditions. So here is one example. We have this uh, benzylic tertiary alcohol so you can imagine most of the time we want to do the debug, uh, we put some acid in, but for this benzylic tertiary alcohol, they will eliminate, and this is definitely not ideal. But when, when we put into the thermal neutral conditions like THF, 250 degrees, then we manage to get product out uh, at okay yield, say like that. So this is actually, you get something else, so it's actually not so bad. So another case about the this uh, pack, uh, corporate amino alcohol thing with a bulk protected, and then we can put the HFIP to increase the acidity of the reaction condition. Then we can do thermal de depopulation. Then in this case, we don't have to use large amount of the strong acids. And this example is mainly about the microaddition. So ammonia in methanol, we can do the microaddition at room temperature because it cannot heat up as the ammonia will evaporate because the reaction is long and you also have the ester amine exchange to have the amide as the side product. But in flow, we more or less seal the system and push it out very quickly. So we have like a way improved yield with minimal amount of the side product. And the last one is about uh, thermal uh, quinolysynthesis in toluene. So one thing to, to point out is we would like to avoid using high boiling point solvent like diphenyl ether because we think like together with our colleagues uh, for this high boiling point solvent the next step to get rid of it, it will be very painful so we most of the time we try to use toluene uh, thf to methyl thf or this kind of a uh, solvent with relatively lower boiling point with a proper blood pressure regulation to achieve the reaction and for the next step work up or the solvent exchange, it will be much easier. But of course, I need to admit, it's not almighty because when we have solubility issues, we still have to use a uh, highly poly polar solvent like DMF. And some oxidation reactions, like these are oxidants are like restricted by our internal EHNs on a big scale, but in flow, the safety secures uh, the wide usage. And we can do the epoxide formation like quite well for the period in oxide formation, no problem at all. Uh, one thing to highlight on this page is we can do this secondary alcohol into the ketone, uh, like on good scale. So for this reaction, generally when you do like small scale in the lab, people like DMP, but when you go scaling up, DMP, first of all, is very cost efficient. And also for this IOD, uh, reagents, the safety can become an issue. And of course, you can do this reaction on big scale using sworn uh, in batch, but generally need to cool it down to minus 78. But in flow, because the reactive intermediates was gener generated readily and consumed readily, so we only need minus 5 degrees for one minute to generate the reactive intermediates, and we feed the alcohol in, then another minus 50 degrees, then we can finish the oxidation, then we can do 143 grams in one hour. So this really, again, makes the energy and the time more efficient.
The last one is like a rare situation, but it, we do have internal demands to do the oxidation of the amino acid into the nitro group using the Piranha solution. That is probably the last thing you use to clean the dirty fritz in the normal synthetic lab. And it's just dangerous. But in flow, we can feed these two in to form the perosulfuric acid in situ. Then we feed the cyan material in to finish the, the oxidation step. So not super great throughput, but we managed to do it way safer. And about the hazardous reagents, you can imagine for the nitration reaction, it's always better doing flow. In this case, we can do two kilos in one hour. And for the scope quinolosynthesis, we can also do quite well. And the two other examples making the heterocycles, we can have the nitrile uh, cycle addition making the tetragon. But in this case, we use the copper tube as the uh, in situ promoter, as you can understand. And the last one is the cycle addition of the alkyne making the pyrazole. And the advantage in this case is in batch, you need to use the TMS diazomethane in hexane as the solvent, which is related to like 30 something equivalents. But in batch, we only need, uh, in flow, we only need two equivalents to finish this reaction. And we managed to do 150 grams in three hours. Yeah. Then one slide of some methylenous reactions because in flow generally the the control is way better. So here is one example. So in batch uh, we have this electrophilic formulation uh, because the product is still reactive enough. So it will start to react with more things. Uh, then we saw sixty percent of the dibrominated side products, but in flow once the reaction leaves the mixture, leaves the system, it will be quenched instantly. Then we have, by doing this, we can do like really good selective monobromination, achieving 93%. And uh, this one was operated continuously 10 kilos in 31 hours. This is our internal record of a single compound delivered per batch. And this is a, like a tricky mixed noble reaction using crazy conditions. We can do this as well. And uh, for one example of Suzuki reaction, so in the batch, the yield is low. And also we identified the problem as the deordination of the starting material. And also we realized the problem comes from when scaling up of this reaction because the reaction needs to be done at 100 degrees. So doing the end of heating profile is also quite long. So before reaching from like close to room temperature to 100 degrees, the starting material, the iodide, will start to react with the palladium, some base, and some other things maybe. Then it will start to decompose. But in flow, we take the CSTR in this case because there was uh, some uh, solid formation. So we preheat the two feeds into 200 degrees. So more or less in the first uh, vessel, they touch each other. It's already at the reacting 100 degrees. So by doing this uh, technical adjustment, say like that, we managed to do like 100 grams in four hours and with like a way improved yield from 35 to 91. Yeah. Last example is also related to show to showing the good condition control in flow to solve the selectivity issue. So here, like from one gram in batch is 90%, but when you go to 100 gram is only 30. But in flow, in general, the conditions are way more consistent then we managed to, or we secure 95% of the diarrheal selectivity at kilogram scale. Yeah, and of course, the people would like to know about whether it's possible to couple two reactions into one, because it sounds like really ideal in the flow. Of course, we do have examples here. So first is one is about the textbook reaction, like hydroboration oxidation to make the alcohol. So this we can do. Other things we have, we can convert the acid chloride uh, using the TMS diazomethane, then feed the AKS HBB, HBR into the system to generate the uh, alpha bromo ketone. And uh, this one is more MATCAM related, so we can make the sulfonyl chloride in situ, then we feed the uh, amine to make the sulfonamide. Last one is a Sondamide reaction, making into the azide, then we do an in situ 3 plus 2 cycle addition to make the 1, 2, 3 trials. So uh, one page about our instrument. So we do have uh, instrument from international suppliers like Vapertech and Corning, but we still 
bought uh, instrument from domestic suppliers, as you can see in this one. So this is one of our big scaling and photochemistry equipment. So hold up volume is 300 mil. So we can do quite well. And we also have the light source with the wavelengths from 254 to 455. And uh, for the hydrogenation reactor, we have the uh, reactor volume from like small to five mil, and the upper limit is uh, to 1.2 liter. So we can do from like milligram to kilogram scale, so there will be no problem. And uh, recently we have more investment into the gas reactor, making the osmolysis and also the carbonylation and also a little bit touch into the SCF4 for some uh, fluorination chemistry. And for the heating oven, uh, mainly about this uh, heating above 150 degrees. So we have the heating oven and the modules going up to 350 degrees. That's no problem. And the but overall, we need to say for the practical uh, usage or easy maintenance, we would like to or we still like to use the self-assembled reactors. So here is one example. We use for to illustrate. So here we take two peristaltic pumps. We go through some uh, uh, mixing unit. Uh, here is the temperature control unit. Sometimes you can put a ultrasonic uh, tube inside to secure the mixing. Then the reaction cooled mixture floating out and it gets collected under the inert atmosphere using a balloon. So small scale we can do like this. But for uh, upscaling, so this one will be connected to a T shape, and the quenching solution will go will get feed in. Then it's coupled to another tubing system with a good temperature control. Then we can collect the quenched reaction mixture out. And last, I would like to give more credits to our engineer uh, friends. So we realize for the pumping unit, or as everyone can imagine, uh, the accuracy of the pumps determine the overall success of the flow chemistry. But we realize the pumps, they are not always reliable, especially when running overnight or running for a long time. Then we put up some uh, flow meter together with the pump, then put a, like a box to regulate and have the feedback to of the pump performance. Now, if it's out of the set range, then the system will give a pause and you'll get a notification through your phone, like via our internal app. Yeah. So then this is the main part of the flow chemistry, but to show the connection between the HTE platform and the flow chemistry. So here is one slide for that. So this is one reaction we got requested at the 100 grams scale. So in the HTE lab, so as I was uh, responsible, and uh, we screened the uh, photoreactors and uh, with the reaction time as well. So using this uh, zinc sulfinate, so we get some uh, prelim preliminary idea about these things. Then later we also optimize the, the fluorinating agent to change to the sodium sulfinate. Then we also test the small scale with the, with the batch photo. Then later, because in the end they need hundreds of grams, so it's ideal to put into the flow for this reaction. So more or less the general scheme like this, we circulate the reaction mixture using the sulfonate with some photocatalyst and solvent at 455 nanometer, so for nine hours at 40 degrees. So need to admit the circulation in this case is necessary because the reaction overall is not fast enough. But in the end, we managed to do this like within one day. So it's actually quite a good uh, success. So last one, I give it back to Suja to have a general introduction of our the overall platforms. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Jiang, for the interesting sharing of flow chemistry. Actually, uh, not only our HTE platforms and play and flow platforms have been working closely, all the technology platforms in Wuxi Aptec have been working seamlessly to support the projects. In Wuxi Aptec, we have also established extensive experience in preparing molecules with special structures like a covalent chemistry, protect chemistry, lipid chemistry, as well as fluorine chemistry, boron chemistry, stable labeling, fluorescent labeling, biosignal chemistry. We are also a big fan of the modern technologies. For instance, photochemistry, electrochemistry, enzyme chemistry, 
Automated Robotic Synthesizer, PMC. We also provide solutions to make research go faster while being more cost efficient. From MedCam design to library synthesis, scale up, process optimizations, and so on. In summary, we provide a comprehensive solution to all the projects in Wuxi Aptai. That's pretty much what we would like to share for today. And this slide leads us to the end of our presentation. Thanks very much, everyone, for your kind listening. We'll be very happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much for that fascinating presentation. Uh, we do have some questions from the attendees. The first question is, can you comment on how successfully you are able to scale up the conditions from HTE to a larger scale? Uh, hello, Kelly. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Sujia from HTE platform of Wuxi App Tech. I will be very happy to answer the questions. Actually, if you can optimize the condition at uh, miniaturize the scale in HTE, then you can scale up the reaction in larger scale. But uh, when we scale up the reaction, we have different scales like uh, the milligram scale, a uh, hundred gram scale, kilogram scale, or even larger. So if we only need to uh, scale up the reaction to milligram or gram scale, you don't need to worry about uh, the producibility. If when you need to scale up the reaction to more than 100 grams, then you need to make sure that uh, all the reagents or starting material, uh, like uh, the bases that you, you use for the HTE screening, is from the same wonder when you scale up the reaction. That in the backward coupling reaction, if you use cesium carbonate, then it's quite different uh, of the particle size from different wonders. So you need to make sure all the uh, all the uh, reagent results of HTE screening. But if you need to scale up the reaction to a kilogram scale or even larger, then you need to do extensive screening of all the reaction or variables in the HTE optimization. And you also need to test uh, the reproducibility in gram scale, uh, 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 10 or 20 gram scale, uh, in your HT lab after you transfer the condition back to the project team. Uh, I'm not sure if I have, I have answered the questions. Actually, if you can do the reaction in HD scale, then you can do the reaction in larger scale. As long as you make sure all the reagents uh, are from the same wonder source uh, when you scale up the reaction. All right, the next question is about slide 30. Um, someone's asking, in slide 30, you showed a NBS bromination reaction. And they're saying, I am curious why flow leads so much higher yield in this case. Uh, thank you for the question. So I'm talking from the for the flow part. So this is actually for the batch reaction. This, we believe, is uh, some uh, region compatibility issue. And also for the MBS, AIBN, the uh, tetrachlorocarbon, this is like so unfriendly. But in this case, for the photochemistry, it's like uh, MBS and the irradiation with a 455, uh, 455 nanometer irradiation makes the reaction really good. Then, as I mentioned before, during the presentation, the scaling up for photochemistry in batch is like uh, very painful. Then we couple to the flow chemistry then it just like we managed to reach the good throughput to 1.1 kilo in 90 minutes. So it, I will give the credits to the photochemistry. Next question is, if impurities arise during the flow synthesis reaction, is it necessary to perform operations such as filtering? Uh, this is like, I'm not 100% sure uh, what it means by filtering, but it can be the system becomes uh, relatively unstable. That's why I mentioned in the last part is like we put some, uh, let's say the flow meter to make sure the pump operates at the, the reliable state. Of course, during the process, we do some uh, offline analysis like TLC, LCMS or HPLC, these things to cons constantly monitor the outcome. And uh, you may also wonder whether we couple some like uh, 
let's say the PAT thing, uh, the answer is actually not at this moment. Yeah. Thank you. The next question is how high of a temperature are you able to go in the flow with your equipment? Uh, now for our heating module, we can go up to 350 degrees, but of course you can imagine we don't want to heat up unless we have to. Usually the operating range for us is between 150 to 250 degrees. That's the most common heating range for us. Next question is, how do you determine the yields of your HTE experiments? If you need to determine the yield of the different substrates of the same substrates with different conditions, you better add in internal standard. If you have authentic sample, then that would be great. If you don't have the authentic sample, then you need to uh, you need to calibrate uh, the ratio of the product area, UV area percentage to the internal standard, and you determine which is the best yield of the ratio of the area percentage. Then you will calculate the other the yield of the other reactions of based on the best reaction. Anyway, you need to add in internal standard. The next question is about photochemistry flow using fan cooling. How can this be transferred when it is scaled up? Uh, fan cooling, you mean from batch into flow or? Uh, would you repeat the question, please? Yeah, yes, let me read the question again. So they said oh, okay. photochemistry flow using fan cooling. How can this be transferred when it is scaled up? Oh, yeah, uh, <clears throat> for a small reaction, it is uh, like small reactor, say like that in batch, and uh, they have the fan cooling, but for the scaling up thing, it can be with the fan cooling, but it's always coupled to some temperature sensor to make sure the temperature is in the decent range. And also, it, it can be for the photoreactor on a big scale, it's coupled to some uh, liquid cooling system to make sure the temperature control is even better. So in that sense, there's no fan cooling anymore. Could you please provide a description of your fixed bed reactor systems for flow chemistry? Uh, fixed bed reactor, so let's say for the hydrogenation one, so it's like a hollow tube. Then for two parts, you have this uh, screw part on, and uh, we have this uh, filter at two ends. Then between that, you have this uh, solid supported uh, catalyst. Then that is kind of the general setup for the packed back reactor. And it's the same when you have the uh, heterogeneous catalysis using immobilized enzymes. It's exactly the same setup. Next question is, what is the typical scale and reaction volume for reaction screening? Uh, actually, the uh, typical scale is 5 micromole to 10 micromole for each direction. And the reaction volume will be about 100 microliter. That is for the traditional metal catalysis. But for the photoredox catalysis, you need to be very careful about the reaction uh, solvent volume because if you have too much solvent, then the light will the light cannot penetrate the reaction uh, the reaction mixture. So for the photoredox reaction. It's better that uh, the reaction volume will be less than 0 0.5, uh, about, about a fi uh, 0 0.5 uh, milliliter. But for the traditional metal catalysis, that would be uh, according to based on different uh, concentration of the reaction type. For the buck water coupling reaction, actually, uh, the more concentrated of the reaction, the, more, the better yield of the reaction, we usually will use 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 the concentration of the reaction. All right, that's all the time that we have today. Any questions we didn't get to answer during this live webinar will be answered over email after today's event. And thank you again to Dr. Tao Guo, Dr. Tua Jung, and Dr. Suja Liu for your fascinating presentation.
and thank you participants for being a great audience. Be sure to check CNEN or CNEN online for information on the next edition of CNEN webinars. Thank you to ON24 for technology and production services. And thank you, Wuxi Aptech, for the sponsorship that made this interactive webcast possible. For CNEN webinars, I'm Kelly McSweeney. Goodbye.